Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Yes, right? absolutely. Right? And um, you can ask, hey, Sam, I'd like to ask you anything about normative or, <laughs> or predictive. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but he's up to it. So you can ask him a question if you want to. And uh, so he's going to talk about comparing mechanisms by their vulnerability to manipulate. Uh, great. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, this is a, a talk based on joint work with Typhoon Sonmez, who teaches at Boston College. Um, so the starting point for what we're trying to think about today is uh, the, uh, the idea that um, vulnerability of mechanisms to manipulation plays a key role in their evaluation. It both um, when people think about proposing new mechanisms or um, um, in particular circumstances, some of which I'll talk about today, there's been a lot of discussion about whether this mechanism is easy or hard to game or uh, easy or hard to manipulate. So one uh, concept that has been widely studied um, is this idea of strategy proofness. Okay, so this, um, what this means is that it's a requirement that a mechanism um, have a dominant strategy where everyone reports the truth. Um, so this has been widely studied, mechanisms have been characterized, um, <coughs> and this has actually been important in uh, the choice of some real-life mechanisms. So I will talk some more about that. Um, now, unfortunately, if we restrict ourselves to strategy-proof mechanisms, there's usually a trade-off between um, having this dominant strategy property or lack of gaming and other reasonable properties like um, whether the mechanism yields an efficient outcome or whether it's uh, going to yield a fair outcome. So what we want to do is think about uh, a way to uh, compare direct mechanisms mechanisms that are not strategy proof based on uh, how easy they are to manipulate. Okay? Um, so let me just tell you about some existing approaches to this question. Uh, it's actually a very old question that comes uh, all the way back to Arrow's and possibility theorem. So after Arrow's theorem, people started to say, well, how, um, <coughs> you know, should we worry about uh, strategic voting? How hard are certain voting systems to manipulate? And so there's a class of literature that I've uh, called non-equilibrium based approaches to this. Okay? So there is work uh, that tries to say um, how computationally complex is it to compute a manipulation. So okay. people were talking about this even before the computer scientists jumped into the game. Right? Uh, and so this computational complexity, uh, you know, there's a guy named Jim Orlin who I think is an operations researcher who has written a number of papers on this. Um, and um, <coughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, there are results like if we look at a particular voting rule, like the board account, if we are able to observe everyone else's uh, preferences uh, over candidates, and I can construct an algorithm that would compute my best response, how computationally complex is that? So I call this non-equilibrium because the exercise is, you know, suppose I got to see what everyone else is doing, what, uh, what's my best thing? Mm -hmm. okay. Another uh, class of uh, ways to think about this question is what I call the maximal domain approach. So people would say, let's look at this mechanism. If we go back to our classic results of Gibbard and Satterthwaite and Arrow. There are very uh, few restrictions on the class of preferences they're considering in those results. So people have gone on to say, why don't we focus on a very narrow class of, of preferences, for instance. So, um, uh, and what is the largest class of preferences for which a mechanism is impossible to manipulate? Um, so results like if we think about majority voting and assume people have single peak preferences, then majority voting is a strategy proof mechanism. So that's one class of uh, approaches people have looked at. The second class... And, uh, and yeah. why do you call that one non-equilibrium? Because for any class of preferences, don't you 
calculate what the equilibrium would be or not? No, I'm just saying um, let's take a particular mechanism and for what set of preferences uh, is it a dominant strategy? So n it's a decision problem at that stage. Um, that's right. Um, second class of uh, approaches to this question are what I call equilibrium-based uh, approaches. So we can uh, always try to characterize the equilibrium of the game induced by the mechanism and ask the question, do the strategies look complicated? Okay, so I put complicated in quotes because uh, a difficulty is trying to formalize what we mean by complicated. Okay, and perhaps that's one of the, the most important questions in mechanism design is th to link uh, what we uh, see uh, in the world to uh, what we actually compute as the optimal thing. Okay, so there's a, a bunch of papers that try to make arguments along this line. Uh, related to that are people who try to study uh, what assumptions would be needed for people to tell the truth and for that to be an equilibrium. Um, and the way this literature has progressed is, let's try to say, if I have very little information about other people, um, uh, and everyone has this very coarse information, it's in my best response to tell the truth. Uh, and that's a Nash equilibrium. Um, so this is preceded by looking at the informational requirements. Often the arguments are based on uh, a large number of participants. Um, so this is co quite common in the auction literature. So I have a paper um, doing this for a class of matching problems, uh, the college admissions model. Um, so that's a, a, another approach to that. Now, before I keep going, let me just uh, <coughs> um, try to address this question. It always comes up, why do we care about manipulation, right? So um, I think there are a few responses. Um, uh, the first response is that uh, I think there is a widespread sense that telling the truth is simple, OK? Um, it's straightforward. It's easy to compute what your true preferences are. Um, Okay, so that's uh, an argument that's often given. Uh, another argument that people often say, why do we care about manipulation, is if the information of the participants is going to be used for reasons other than computing the allocation. So the example that's often brought up is in social choice. We have a voting rule. Why do we want it to be truthful? Because we want to know what the population actually thinks about a particular policy, so the candidates will be responsive to that. Okay. Um, so that's uh, a second argument. Uh, now, a third argument is um, we are concerned about people who do not understand or comprehend the rules. So this is kind of a fairness argument. Uh, now, for both of these points, this uh, post-allocation uh, interaction and this fairness or equity concern, an approach is to try to model that. Right? So let's write down the game, think of the mechanism, and then think about the candidates reacting to the votes that so they received. Exactly. And some people know how to, like the smart or the more, yeah. the more savvy people know how to game it and the less savvy people, yeah. and that's unfair. That's exactly right. So that, that's a, a point that comes across in uh, the mechanism design approach to student assignment. So I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about that. That's where I've done a lot of my work. So um, uh, yeah, so that's the basic idea. If, if it takes resources to strategize, if people need to understand exact mechanisms, what are the exact procedures, then uh, people who do not have access to, or, or do not have the resources to strategize are going to be hurt because of that. Now, uh, my own view on this is, uh, yes, that's right. But as an analyst, you know, we can model that. We can try to think of a game where people are not sophisticated um, and uh, think about the consequences of that. So, um, so I've done that as well. And I'm open-minded to this approach. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> No, so you know, the hard thing about this approach is, what do we mean by not understanding or comprehending the rules? So what we've done in this paper, um, w again with Typhoon, is we said, suppose people just tell the truth. Okay? So we're thinking of children in the Boston school assignment system, the system that they had until 2005. Um, and there are some people who don't understand the rules, the complicated rules. So let's take the, um, you know, the simple strategy, the, ir the irrational strategy, to be you tell the truth. In other problems, it's not as natural, I think, to think of what the simple, you know, what the, um, what the strategy will be for people who don't understand or comprehend the rules. We don't have a real nice way to model that, I think, uh, in general. Okay, so, um, so here are three reasons why we might care about manipulation. I'm going to be talking about a general property of mechanisms. And I just want to emphasize, I don't want to say the property that I'm going to think about is the only criteria we should consider. Okay? The, when we think about what mechanism we want to use, 
we have to think about trade-offs on many different dimensions. Incentives, efficiency, fairness, learnability, computability, etc. Okay, so my objective uh, today is mostly to try to make sense of what others have been saying. Okay, so uh, let me go into the framework and then talk about the specific examples. Are there any questions before I do this? Yeah. Okay, so I have a I finite... I warned yeah. him. In fact, what I said to him was that if people don't ask questions, it means that they're not interested in the fields of which we come from. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> and I explained it was different in some other fields. So, and I asked him wh where his field stood, and he said his field, well, his department has a very loud person. Talkative so. place, yes. <laughs> it's not just our own, yes, okay. So. Not just our own, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let me just uh, define some notation um, when I um, uh, talk about what I mean by manipulation. So we have a finite number of players. Uh, we have a, s a set of allocations, capital A. We're going to think of our players as having preferences over allocations. Um, um, so everything I'm going to be working with here is finite. Yeah, it doesn't really matter, actually, uh, for the general thing. Yes. So, so all of this will become much more concrete in the specific examples that I'm going to talk about. So I have six examples in mind, and it'll be very uh, transparent what I mean by the allocation in those examples. Um, okay, so we have uh, players. Uh, we have a type space. Players have um, types. Um, a problem is defined in terms of the types of players, what your preferences are. And we're focusing just on direct mechanisms. So those are mechanisms which are mappings from uh, the type space to allocations. Okay, so what do I mean by manipulable? Um, I'm going to say that mechanism um, psi is manipulable by agent I at problem T. If there exists a type, so a report of a player I, T I prime, such that when he reports T I prime, he's doing strictly better than when he reports T, uh, T I. Okay, so the notation here is uh, psi sub i is the allocation received by player i uh, when the reports are ti prime and t uh, minus i. And that's strictly preferred, that's what p is here, uh, to the allocation when uh, he reports the truth. <coughs> okay? I see, and it's, um, it's individual, um, right, so it's individual-centric. Uh, individual-centric, exactly. Oh, uh, no, so R in general is w could be weak preferences. So what I'm requiring here is P is a strict preference. So if I manipulate, if I don't tell the truth, I'm strictly better off than when I tell the truth. That's all I'm saying here. Okay. But I don't understand. It's, I don't understand it's an inequality. I mean, <coughs> according to his preference list, it's strictly. Does this preferred. equation mean that Ri or Psi I or whatever is strictly larger than Ri? Or I mean, what is yes. this? Yeah, so the notation is, it's a, you could think of this as like a, uh, a preference ordering, right? So that's a, a, a partial order uh, uh, um, where um, I'm saying this is strictly preferred by agent I to this over here. So the notation Ri just means weak preference. Yeah, okay. sorry if that's unclear. Uh, okay, so uh, this is what we mean by manipulable. Uh, and so we want to think about two notions to compare direct mechanisms based on their vulnerability to manipulation. Okay, so um, the first notion is what I call weakly more manipulable. Uh, so the notion says uh, mechanism um, psi is weakly more manipulable than mechanism phi. If for any problem where phi can be manipulated, mechanism psi can also be manipulated. Okay, even though the converse doesn't hold. So whenever I can find an agent who can manipulate um, phi, I can find an agent who can manipulate uh, psi. Okay? And I have to have a problem where I can manipulate one of the mechanisms but not the other. So there's some content. What is sort of problem? I'm, I'm sorry? What's a problem? Oh, problem, again, it's a set of preferences, basically. Okay. So it's a set of types. Yeah. OK, so uh, that's the weak notion. Um, uh, an equivalent definition of this uh, weak notion is the following. So if truth-telling is a Nash equilibrium under psi, it's also a Nash equilibrium under phi, okay? uh, even though the converse doesn't hold. Okay. So um, that's one way to think about this. The idea I want to think about is if I can all, whenever I can find one guy who can manipulate A, I can find someone who can manipulate B 
I say B is more manipulable than A. So in this week, and there's some kind of equivalence among. The per it's not like you care that it's more manipulable by this by this individual than by that. Yeah. So that's exactly getting at the, the next issue. So in this notion, I'm I'm saying. If I can find some guy, be it player one, who can manipulate, I can find some guy who can manipulate a player, uh, player two, reality, player three. Of course, there are going to be, like, you might want, you know, you, you don't want it that, like, the poor people can't manipulate it and the rich people can, but if it were the other way around, or the, the people who don't have the resources, so if you could arrange it in yep. some other way, you might not care as much because it would be leveling the playing field rather than, or I, I don't know whether you that's a great phrase, actually. Keep that phrase in mind, because I'm going to come back to that leveling the playing field many times, actually. Qu there's some questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, I don't know. It, it seems like one direction is true, but I don't see why the other is. I do not see why the other is. What, what direction? I'm sorry. Uh, the first the second statement doesn't apply. We don't see how the second applies to the first. The first implies You the said second. equivalently, and they oh, oh, said sorry. that equivalence means. <laughs> Oh, so you see that you're happy with this implying this? Yeah, but not the other. Okay, so uh, we want to show this implies this, right? Yeah. So suppose um, the contrapositor. This implies this. So um, Should, that should I go into this? The <laughs> you guys might be right, but if you keep them in. Even though in the cell, at least one case is the one. So it's yeah. all slightly yes. better than one. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that's. that's uh, is that what you're unhappy about, the even though? Once you notice it, it becomes equivalent. Uh, okay, so uh, you're happy with this implying this, right? Yeah. Okay, so how do we prove this implies this? Um, <clears throat> so the way I can show this, uh, what I could show is uh, suppose not this, then not this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so suppose um, it's the case that, um <clears throat> you know, the, the real thing that's going on here is I am uh, looking at whether, how well you do when you have some report T minus I. So you could think of T minus I as the reports of everyone else, mm -hmm. right? So if it's not the case that, um, if, if we can manipulate uh, here, then it's not going to be a Nash equilibrium in truth-telling. Okay, so then it's not going to be a Nash equilibrium in truth-telling in the other mechanism. So that's, that's how we go the other way. Um, why, why don't I uh, show you this in a particular example, actually, this might be a little bit clearer, because I want to define this in a very abstract sense, but what I want to do is apply this to very particular mechanisms. Okay, so, uh, second definition um, is the following. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah? Uh, yeah, so n none of the mechanisms I want to think about are strategy proof, right? If they're strategy proof, the whole issue of manipulation doesn't make any sense, right? So another way to think about this actually is uh, you can uh, argue that requiring that a mechanism is strategy proof uh, is the same thing as requiring that for all problems um, people are going to have a Nash equilibrium in truth telling. Okay, so that's a result from implementation theorem. So since I don't have a strategy proof mechanism, there are some problems where people will not have a Nash equilibrium in truth telling. So I want to compare the size of those sets. Okay, um, okay second uh, version of this. And you don't care about the identity of those sets. Uh, so in the first version, I don't care about who is the guy manipulating. The second version, I will. Okay, so this is the strong version mechanism. Uh, psi is strongly more manipulable than mechanism phi. If for any problem where phi oh. can be manipulated, mechanism psi can be manipulated by each agent who can manipulate phi. Okay, the difference here is I'm requiring the manipulating agent to be the same. Okay, uh, and also we need to have some content here so there's at least one problem where someone can manipulate um, psi but so, uh, phi cannot be manipulated. Okay, so um, the examples I want to think about, I have three examples from the literature on matching theory and three examples from auction theory. Okay. Um, 
So let me just uh, make a few comments uh, about this. Um, the first comment is, we talked about this, um, two different approaches to this. Um, the first oh, is the this, way, yeah. You know, well, I don't know whether. It's 530, right? Right, it's 530. Yeah, OK. Uh, great. So um, first comment is, uh, this is an uh, approach that's in between equilibrium and non-equilibrium approaches, OK? So um, second comment, so no one has raised this yet. So uh, this, this bullet point here is for preemptive reasons, but no one has raised this. <laughs> Why would you object to this, OK? Well, what, when we think about manipulation, one thing that I'm ignoring is how much a guy gains from manipulation, right? All I'm asking is the existence of a manipulation um, on one mechanism implies the existence of a manipulation in the other mechanism. But you, don't, you can't even ask this question because you only have partial orders and not monies, right? He's saying, you know, so cardinal uh, versus ordinal kind of. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so we, we, you could define a notion, for instance, if you committed to a utility representation and then a ask that question. That's exactly why I've just started with the ordinal world because I, have, I don't even need the utility representation. Uh, so if you're thinking about this problem generally, what, what could you think about? You could think about a, a notion that thinks about how much one gains with respect to their cardinal uh, preferences. Okay? Uh, and I think that's reasonable. Um, and in particular, if you have two mechanisms that are equally manipulable, so whenever I can manipulate one, I can manipulate the other and vice versa, uh, I think this might be a, a way to think about breaking ties in those situations. So we say the amount someone can gain is always larger in uh, mechanism A when he manipulates than in mechanism B. Then I'll say um, um, <coughs> you know, w uh, A is more manipulable uh, than B. So. Uh, so that's one objection that no one has raised, so maybe I'm spending too much time on this. <laughs> Second objection, uh, in my notion, what I'm requiring is that someone who, when they're manipulating, they know what the reports of someone else is, okay? Mm. Um, so, you know, we talked about informational requirements. That's the one that just me more than the first one. Yeah, so because I could think that in both cases, agent I can manipulate, but in one case, the guy who wants to manipulate has to sort of think for five years, and the other case, yeah, so I would put that under the strategic complexity approach to this problem. Which is the thinking for five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, if you worry about in the information requirements, I'm, again, I'm happy with thinking about the problem this way. I'm, I want to just propose a different way to think about this. Um, uh, you know, we can characterize how much information you would need to uh, figure out whether you manipulate it. So I've done that in other papers. I'm totally happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to do here is just explore, I think, a very simple idea. Uh, in Maybe it's presumptuous, but I think this is a natural first step, okay? So all I want to get across is I have two mechanisms. Whenever some guy can game in one, if he can also game in the other, then the second mechanism is strongly more manipulable than the first, okay? Um, and I think the strength of this, actually, in r relative to uh, the approaches that people have studied before, is that I can apply this to six uh, examples. So this works in not just one problem, okay? So um, most of the other approaches that I've talked about have been characterized for a very particular mechanism. This is a way we can organize um, six particular examples. And the, the nice thing about most of these examples that, is that these are models of mechanisms that people actually uh, are going and playing uh, in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can apply it for the degree, or I can order, order two mechanisms. Yeah, so I have only a few results of saying what's, you know, if we can find a strategy proof mechanism, that's the least manipulable mechanism, right? Um, but among a class of um, not strategy proof mechanisms, you can ask uh, what's the least manipulable of those. So I have a few results. The first one is of that nature, but um, uh, actually the second one is also of that nature. So, um, but in the auction results, I don't, I don't have that result. Yeah, so that's what I mean by applying. So let's talk about a specific example. Let's put some meat on this. So. Uh, the model I want to start with is the famous college admissions model of Galen Shapley. Okay, so this is a model where we have uh, students S and colleges C. Uh, the primitives, uh, students have a strict ranked ordering over colleges uh, as well as uh, a preference over remaining unassigned. Uh, colleges have maximum capacity, so there's multiple uh, seats at a college, and they have responsive preferences over groups of students. Okay? Uh, what does that mean? That means that your ranking of a student is independent of your ranking of her colleagues. Okay, so responsive preferences 
is ruling out some kind of complementarity in preferences. Okay? Uh, so I, I'm going to just work with that assumption. That, that's uh, the type of thing we, ha we usually assume when we have uh, problems with multiple units of capacity. Okay? Complementarities create big issues in these problems. Okay. Uh, the notation uh, is mu is a matching. Uh, that's simply an assignment of students to colleges such that no more students are assigned to a college than its capacity. Okay. Now the central uh, axiom that's studied uh, in this literature is the axiom of stability. Um, so what do we mean by that? We say a matching mu is stable. This is a really naive question. <laughs> uh -huh. um, okay. I was just thinking that the complementarity is, of course, very important in real life situations. I mean, I don't want to get like all great English majors and no science majors, right? Mm -hmm. or, you know, if I'm picking members of yeah. a team, I mean, I don't want like all first basemen and no outfielders or something. Um, is it is it possible? And it might just blow up in how complex it is. But is it possible to look at the problem with complementary as this in a much bigger space? Um, yeah, you know, in some sense, why do we uh, make this assumption of responsivity? It's mm -hmm. definitely an unnatural assumption. Uh, one reason is if you look at um, areas where this model is actually used as an mm -hmm. algorithm, like in the medical residency matching program. Mm -hmm. um, if we allowed people to express preferences over peer groups, it becomes a very computationally demanding right. program to say, I like this set, and then this set, and then this set. Right. So what responsivity allows us to do... As, a, as, as like um, simple preferences on a, mu on a much bigger set, but it, 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 it grows like the power set of yeah, that's, that's right. So responsivity allows us, and what happens in practice, <coughs> we just put an ordering over individuals, actually. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, sorry, that was a... No, that, that, that's, that's, that's fine, actually. It's an unnatural assumption. Unfortunately, we don't know much about these models when we don't have responsive preferences, actually. It's just a very complicated problem at that stage. Uh, okay, so this uh, notion of stability, what does this mean? It means that there is no pair of agents who could block the allocation. Okay, so there is no student and college pair such that student I prefers college C to her assignment. And either the college has a vacant seat or has a lower ranked student, uh, J, who nonetheless received a seat at college C. Okay, so there we say that a matching is stable if there is no blocking pair, no pair of student and college who could recontract. Okay, now this is a, a, a class of problems where there is no mechanism that's stable and strategy proof. Okay, so as the analyst, we're stuck. We wanted to look at strategy-proof mechanisms. We also like this uh, equity requirement, or you could say this is an equilibrium requirement, that it's going to be stable. Um, but there's no mechanism that's stable and strategy-proof for all participants. Okay. Now, if we focus on um, the following mechanism, however, we can uh, <coughs> have somewhat of a positive result. Um, so this is a result due to Dubin's and Friedman and Roth, that Truth-telling is a dominant strategy for one side of the market, so uh, for students in particular, in the following student-optimal stable mechanism. So this is a mechanism that's based on uh, the celebrated <coughs> deferred acceptance algorithm. Okay, so in round one of this algorithm, each student applies to her first choice college, and each college rejects the lowest ranking students in excess of its capacity. Okay, so round one, colleges get the proposals, they keep their most preferred students, rejecting those that are uh, violating its capacity constraint. In the general round, students who've been rejected propose to their next highest choice. Colleges look at those they've been temporarily holding plus the new applicants and keep the best in that set up to capacity. Okay, um, so the algorithm terminates when the students are, either there's no new proposals or students have exhausted their lists. Now, uh, that's the student proposing version of this mechanism. Um, you can also define the college proposing version of the mechanism where we just replace the role of students in colleges. Okay? Uh, now, um, there's a, a result saying, well, we had this positive results if we just focus on students because there's just one student. But because we have multiple units of capacity, uh, there is no stable mechanism where truth telling is a dominant strategy for each college. Okay? So if we wanted to think about colleges, um, can we uh, use the college optimal stable mechanism and will that be strategy proof? The answer is no. And the reason is because we have multiple units of capacity. 
So let's think about a very, very simple example of this. Okay, so I have a problem here with two colleges, C1 and C2. College 1 has a capacity of 2, and College 2 has a capacity of 1. Okay, so multiple units of capacity. The preferences are as follows. Okay, so the way to read this is student 1 prefers College 1 to College 2, and then he uh, um, preferred College 2 to being unassigned. Student 2 has the exact opposite preferences. Okay, student 2 prefers College 2 to College 1. Um, the preferences of the uh, colleges are here. So the College 1 prefers the set student 1 and student 2 to just the individual student, student 2, to student 1. Uh, and um, College 2, when you look at the singletons, has the opposite ordering. Okay, so let's think about what happens here. Um, what's a stable matching in this problem? So the, an easy way to compute that is just apply the student optimal stable mechanism. Okay, so the students will propose to their first choice. Uh, that's College 1 and College 2. College 1 has two units of capacity, and student 1 is acceptable, so he's going to be held. College 2 has uh, one unit of capacity, and student 2 is also acceptable, so he's going to be held. So we have a stable matching where 1 goes to 1 and 2 goes to 2. Uh, it turns out this is the only stable matching in this problem. Um, so let's, thought, let's think about what would happen if we put student 2 at College 1 and student 1 at College 2. Um, if we were to do that, uh, College 1 prefers having the pair of students 1 and 2 to any individual student. So if we force student 1 to go to College 2, he's going to say, I'd rather go to College 1, and uh, College 1 would rather have me together with student 2. Okay, so in this very, very simple example, the only stable matching is 1 going to 1 and 2 going to 2. So whether you're using the college optimal rule or the student optimal rule, you'll get to this uh, matching. Now, how can this be manipulated? Well, suppose College C submits uh, a manipulated preference where only student 2 is acceptable. Uh, what happens? Okay, so uh, if only student 2 is acceptable, uh, the only stable matching, so uh, the exercise we want to think about, College 1 says, the only guy I can take is um, <coughs> uh, student 2. One is not acceptable, and the pair is not acceptable to me. Uh, what would happen? Um, well, what happens is, if we think about the student proposing algorithm, one proposes to college one, but college one says, you're not acceptable to me anymore. The only guy who's acceptable to me is uh, student two, so he gets rejected. Okay, so then uh, one will then be asked to propose to his next choice. His next choice is college two. He's the most preferred guy at college two, so he will beat anyone who's temporarily held there. Um, so uh, student two then will propose to his next choice, College 1, and he'll be acceptable at College 1. Okay, so what's going on here is College 1 is exploiting um, uh, um, this manipulation. He's rejecting Student 1 strategically to induce him to apply somewhere else. That's freeing up a student that he prefers. Okay? Um, so when we do that, uh, we still have this uh, uh, problem. There's only one stable matching, but now College 1 is better off. Okay? Previously, College uh, 1 was getting Student 1. That's his third in the list. Now he's getting his second in the list. Okay, so we've just shown you that um, uh, College 1 benefits by manipulating his preferences under any stable mechanism, uh, including the college optimal rule. Okay. So uh, uh, now we're ready to present our first result. Okay, so, yeah, of course, sorry. Uh -huh. That's right, yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. Uh, and that's actually important uh, because I'm going to, um, for this result, I'm going to fix the student preferences and just focus on the colleges, okay? For the students, we know we have a dominant strategy mechanism, the student optimal rule. Colleges, there is no strategy proof rule. Our first result is that the student optimal stable mechanism is strongly more manipulable than the college optimal stable mechanism, okay? So uh, for colleges, the most manipulable, st player same wise. guy, yeah, player-wise, exactly. The same uh, agent can manipulate. Okay, so uh, you might expect this result. You know, the student optimal stable mechanism is called student optimal because it's the best for the students, right? Mm -hmm. It turns out that it's the most manipulable for the colleges. Okay, um, 
Now, why uh, is this interesting? Well, we have this program in the U.S., the National Residency Matching Program. Um, it's a, a, a scheme that uh, graduating medical students use to get assigned to college, uh, to, to residency programs for. So my wife went through this scheme two years ago. And in the late 90s, there was this big crisis of confidence. That's not a good thing to tell anyone, actually, that you study these things when you go through this system. But um, in the late 90s, uh, uh, there was this big crisis of confidence uh, with the medical match. Um, and um, the reason was the core algorithm used by the system was based on the uh, college optimal stable mechanism. Okay? So we saw in that mechanism, um, I, we actually, we didn't see it, but in that mechanism, students don't have a dominant strategy. They only have one in the student optimal mechanism. So there was a, a, a heated policy discussion, and what they did is they switched from the college optimal rule to the student optimal rule in the late 90s. Okay? And they also did a few other reforms. Um, one was to handle couples, dealing with couples. Uh, and this reform was mimicked by many other labor market clearinghouses, so other medical specialties, uh, some um, uh, uh, positions for lawyers in, in Canada go through schemes like this. Positions for rabbis actually go through schemes like this. Uh, so Al Roth, for instance, has doc I'm sure he's talked to you guys about this uh, when he came here, right? About so kidneys. About kidneys, I see. Yeah. Okay, so uh, according to our definition, uh, um, switching from the college optimal rule to the student optimal rule, while it benefited the incentives for students, it actually made the uh, mechanism more manipulable, strongly more manipulable for the residency programs. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to actually skip the proof. And, yeah. and now there's also a question which I know um, some of our ex postdocs have looked at, which it, who you probably know, um, which is uh, how often is it manipulable anyway? So are these serious manipulations in the sense that it's not just that you can find some fraction that goes to zero with the size of the system, but is this like, have, have you looked at all of the density of manipulations? Yeah, uh, so that's actually the, the paper that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. You can say if we have a large number of participants, mm -hmm. perhaps it's very hard to manipulate this mechanism. Right. So uh, Fuhito Kojima and I have a paper um, um, where we look at that, that particular mm -hmm. problem. And what we can show is that in the student optimal mechanism, under some s assumptions, some of which may be strong, mm -hmm. uh, the likelihood a college can manipulate is uh, um, getting smaller as the size of the market grows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another approach to <coughs> do. Computer scientists have worked on this, um, Mohamed Madian oh, right. and Nicole and Merlika, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that, that's a very nice paper, actually. Um, Okay, so I'm going to skip the proof of this actually uh, and go on to the next result. Uh, I was yeah. About this. Yeah, yeah, sure. So is this observed in practice that the uh, colleges try to manipulate? Uh, it's a little bit hard if you were to take a data set of preferences to say, are these manipulated preferences? Um, so I, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about this in the student assignment case because you have no external way to see what your true preferences are. Mm -hmm. So you could think about running a survey. So you'd go to the college and say, did you manipulate or not? But <laughs> that also faces the issue of, are you going to tell the truth in that survey, right? Yeah. Uh, there is a... Is there any evidence? The, uh, for, uh, for colleges, uh, are they manipulating more or less? There's no evidence that, that I, I'm aware of. There's no hard evidence on this. I can give you some more. When, when you get to the school problem, we'll have a lot more s things to say about hard there, evidence. Yeah. There are cases in which... Susan has told me about cases with auctions is amazing, mm -hmm. in which she tries to infer what the valuation is yeah. in cases in which she, you know, it's not truthful, so there's no reason to assume that what you're getting are the real value, what, that the bids are, you know, are simply the, the valuations, yeah. and yet she finds with kind of, within certain bounds, she can infer valuations from bids. That's right. Uh -huh. um, are you able to do anything like that here? Is there some way of, within bounds, inferring something about whether people are manipulating or not in the same way that she and others have done this with auctions? Uh, um, I think what we're able to say with some confidence is that people are making mistakes uh, rather mm -hmm. than they're playing optimally. So can I defer that question yeah, for a few sure, more slides, sure. actually? Uh, yeah, great question. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> 
you know, so I'm fixing the student preferences and only colleges can manipulate, yeah. So I, I can tell you how we can generalize this in, in a few directions um, using uh, essentially the same proof R of this, okay? So um, let phi be an arbitrary stable mechanism, okay? Um, the first generalization is to not compare the extreme points, the student optimal and the college optimal, but to compare any arbitrary stable mechanism to uh, the college optimal rule. And uh, our result is that um, any arbitrary stable matching mechanism other than the college optimal rule is strongly more manipulable for colleges. So the first generalization is we can actually order all stable mechanisms on their manipulability for colleges. Okay? Um, um, and so that, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, <coughs> the second point is saying the, the most manipulable one for colleges is the student optimal one. So that's these two points together give us our ordering. For the students, um, we have the exact opposite, right? So we know that students uh, tell the truth. It's a dominant strategy for them to tell the truth under the student optimal rule. But under the uh, college optimal rule, it's not. But that's the most manipulable mechanism for students. Any other stable mechanism other than um, the student optimal one will be manipulable. Okay? So it's just the exact opposite of what you would ex you know, think, right? The most... Uh, the best one for students is the student optimal one, but the most manipulable one for students is the college optimal yeah, one. Yeah, you get the intermediate ones, what, by randomizing the rounds in some way? Or how would you get, like, like, he, like with the student optimal one, the yeah. students state their preferences. And, the, and so do you, like, randomize the rounds a little bit? Or how do you do it to get so the to compute this? Uh, so there's a very nice mathematical structure to the set of stable matchings, actually. So we could compute the endpoints, the the optimal one for the students and the optimal ones for colleges. Mm -hmm. And actually, they form a lattice. So okay, we could take any uh, combination uh, so of the two. That's right, yeah. That then gets you to all of them. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, the, yeah. The, uh, the generality of the college student matching, or could we just take this in stable marriages? So in stable marriages, uh, we would have um, um, a slightly weaker result because if we had just men and women, it's a one to one matching problem. So. If we focused on one side, it would be a dominant strategy for that side. Um, so we would still have the result that any other stable matching is more manipulable than you know, the, the one that's a dominant strategy. That's obvious. But it, the most manipulable one is the one for the opposite side. Uh, what makes this, I think, a little bit more interesting is when we have the many to one problem, the college admissions problem, mm -hmm. colleges can manipulate every single one, right? even the one that's mm -hmm. optimal for them, for the example that we just saw. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's talk about school choice. So this is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So the, the model is isomorphic to college admissions. Mm -hmm. um, students are the only agents, however. So this is the one distinction that's made uh, in this literature. Um, the students are uh, active players, while the school seats are objects to be consumed um, by uh, these agents. And the way that these seats are prioritized is through some priority ranking. Okay. Um, so those are typically fixed by law, like this, the school committee of Boston or, or in Cambridge here has a policy that says people who live near our school are given higher priority than people who live further away from our school. Um, okay, so they're not actively submitting a preference ordering. Uh, now this idea of vulnerability to manipulation has uh, been a very important feature of uh, school choice mechanisms and the policy discussion of school choice mechanisms. Okay, so. Uh, New York City recently adopted a version of the student optimal stable mechanism. Uh, it, it was adopted in 2003. Uh, so it's the exact algorithm that we just described uh, with this uh, constraint that students can only rank 12 choices. Okay, so um, what they say about this uh, change, so it's a version of the student optimal mechanism. Uh, so this is from the New York Times. We did this to reduce the amount of gaming families had to undertake to navigate a system with a shortage of good schools. Okay? So they're explicitly saying we want to reduce the amount of gaming as a policy objective. Okay? Mm -hmm. Alessandra, you look unhappy. With the, with, with the New York Times. With the New York Times. Okay. <laughs> uh, what, what makes you unhappy about this? I'm just curious. Okay. Uh, okay, now uh, based on the strategy proofness of the student optimal rule, the following advice was given to the students, okay? So you must now rank your 12 choices according to your true preferences, okay? 
So they put this oh, wait, constraint. They, they give you 12 choices or you can make 12 choices? Uh, you can make 12 choices. And so New York City is so a... Ma basically it's a all that they're saying is that the rest of them you just get zeros to. So you are yes. kind of ranking everything just the uh, uh, 13th and higher or all the e equal at the bottom of your list. It's not like they're giving you a set of 12. No, no. So I, I should have said this actually. What happens in New York City? You want to go to high school in New York. There's about 600 high schools in New York right now, okay? There's about 100,000 kids who are going into high school. You live anywhere in the city, you get a, a, a chance to go to any high school in the city. So you live in Staten Island, you can go to the Bronx. You live in Queens, you can go to high schools in Manhattan. You get a booklet with these programs. They describe the attributes of these programs. You fill out a list, okay? And then that list goes into an algorithm. Now, because of uh, the changes in 2003, it's uh, based on the student optimal stable rule. Um, and what they do is they say, well, even though we have these 600 programs, you can only rank 12 choices, okay? Uh, so we can look empirically how many people are actually ranking 12 choices uh, in the data. So this is the average over the last four years. Uh, it's between 70 to 80 percent uh, of people ranking less than 12 choices. What's the curve? Um, are they giving people just listing one? Is that what the majority is? Or the majority no, so the, the, the most common is actually 11. Um, um, <laughs> so... Uh, well, tw tw can you just game it by saying, oh, this is the only acceptable one to me, and that, that wouldn't work? So uh, what happens is if you don't get assigned, you get to go to the next round. And so the next round is a round where you have um, all the, all the schools gone. that are left <laughs> over, yes. Okay. So that's where you've got to go through metal detectors and stuff to get to school. I right? see. So, so, <laughs> so this is also be because of this structure, there's like a repeated, with a, a repeated game aspect to what we uh, yeah. so that's right, a dynamic game. Uh, no, it, it doesn't actually. Th that's why 12 <laughs> is in red, so that's, you're exactly right. So yeah. uh, what's the issue with this 12? You know, despite this quote from the New York Times, they say they're trying to reduce the amount of gaming. All of our theorems about the student optimal stable rule being a strategy proof rule apply when there's no constraint on the number of schools you can rank. Mm -hmm. So New York has decided let's have 12 choices and um, we can ask, is that you know, uh, uh, going to affect people's incentives? Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm a child who likes 20 schools, right? and that's a reasonable thing. There are 600 programs. Mm -hmm. You name the program, it exists. There's a high school for air conditioning and ventilation, for instance. Um, and uh, what do you do? You have 20. You can only rank 12. It's a non-trivial strategic problem, right? Which 12 are you going to declare to be acceptable to you? Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, what we wanted to do is think about saying, well, Intuitively, it seemed to us that the fewer schools that you could rank, the more manipulable the system would be. Right. And so New York defended this choice, despite our, our arguments strongly <laughs> against this, that we were coming from an old system in New York that allowed people to rank five choices. Uh, and that was in a, uh, the pre-Bloomberg Klein era, so there was fewer high schools. Uh, there's about 200 high schools in 2001, say. Um, and so um, if we're going to increase the number of choices, why not? Uh, pick 12. Okay, so we said, well, why are you going to even constrain it at 12? That doesn't make much sense to us. They said, well, it's complex. And it, it definitely is complex. If you look mm -hmm. at this book, how do you figure out what school is good for you? The high school fairs start in seventh grade now in New York City, where people learn about high schools. And well, they said, well, they're somehow they felt uncomfortable with a child getting his 25th choice. It just didn't sound right to them. Well, and every year, keep throwing them back Unfortunately, that child is going to the next round, and he's maybe getting his 12th choice there, so that you could call that his 24th choice. Uh, he's administratively assigned. Uh, so um, you have the main round, about 80,000 uh, people get assigned. Supplementary round, about uh, 12,000 people get assigned. Uh, and then there's about 3,000 people who get assigned administratively. So you get sent to. What they try to do is they manually process you. Uh, over the summer, and they assign you to the school that's closest to you that still has capacity. But isn't it true that some people actually never even submit anything? Just the it's, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. It's about a total of 3,000 people. The, the biggest thing actually is there is so much movement in the city that people come in the summer who have missed this whole process, right? So there's 3,000 people who participated in this process who ended up on assigned. But they say there's about 12,000 people who show up in the summer every year who need to get placed to a high school. Uh, yeah, so most of those people rank uh, much fewer than 12, yeah. So I think the most <coughs> common is you rank five choices. So I mean, it might be not very doable in the sense that if, if you're almost guaranteed to get one of your choices, you rank 12, you're, are you, are 
exactly. What, what I can say for sure is there's at least 20 to 30 percent of people who are ranking 12, and some fraction of those had to face this non-trivial problem of which ones to declare. If you know for sure you like fewer than 12 schools, it's actually still a dominant strategy to express those schools in the right order. Um, so you have to go into the next round. Oh, it's, it's quite small, but we don't know what that means, right? Because those 12 schools could be manipulated, right? Yeah. You like 50 schools, you've chosen which 12, right? So you could actually have really liked to go to Townsend Harris, this great high school in Queens, but you didn't rank it because you don't think you're not going to get it. Uh, so the fact that you got assigned doesn't necessarily mean you're not hurt. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what is the result? Uh, it's this uh, a formalization of this. Uh, intuition that uh, if you constrain the number of choices someone can rank, it's more manipulable. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, suppose L is greater than K, so the proposition states the student optimal stable mechanism where students can rank K schools is weakly more manipulable than the student optimal stable mechanism where students can rank L schools. Okay, so we can use this result to formally argue if you're going to have a constraint, first of all, that's not a great idea if you want a strategy proof mechanism, but you shouldn't make the number larger rather than smaller, okay? If we want to eliminate the, the amount of gaming as they claimed. Maybe they use the term gaming in the sense of giving up an outright score, things like that, but not even... Yeah, but if, if that's their intention, they still have to do that, so you couldn't motivate the reform uh, based on that. Yeah, it's certainly a complex problem, but I, I still have a hard time defending this cap on the number of choices. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I am running out of time, so this is only weakly more manipulable, so you can see the paper for why it's weak and not strong. Let me talk about another mechanism. Uh, this uh, is the... Yeah. when you do this ranking, why right, you say I, I either am assigned there or there or there, or I rather stay unassigned? Uh, you can be assigned. But this is not the case here, right? So no, you can submit that you want to be unassigned. Like children who go to private school, for instance, would say, I'd rather go to Stuyvesant and then Bronx Science, the you know, two strongest high schools in New York. Otherwise, I'll go to private school. So you just rank two. Yeah. You just leave. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But is there any advantage to, uh, I mean, so are you committed if you list three things and you only really think two of these are realistic? Yeah. Is there a disadvantage to listing the third choice? Uh, no, no, because you can you get offered at the third choice and opt out at that stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is what they have the subsequent round for. Um, <coughs> so so some, some of the schools, yeah, it, it rarely happens though. So most of the most oversubscribed schools will not um, um, be available in the subsequent round. The way they get around this practically is they manage the yield. So Townsend Harris has 200 seats a year. They actually make 300 offers because they know 100 of those kids are going to go to private school. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. Uh, if, if their yeah, capacities are fixed expected. or not. Right? I mean, they're using expected <laughs> value or a bound on You're value right to value. say, though, we could take our earlier result and without the cap, you know, this student optimal rule is the most manipulable one for um, the, the other side, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, that would be consistent if they're not telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's. Reward people by being smart by letting them go to the good schools. But it's their parents who are smart and educated. What do you put your investment in the paying attention to your kids? I think if if that argument could be reasonable if there's complementarities in investing in learning what's good for your child and learning the odds of getting into programs. I don't know if there are complements to that. The school administrators don't think there there are actually. That's a major thing that comes up in Boston. So you like to play games. Well, maybe you should think about. You know, figuring out what's good for your child, and then on top of that, you have the the gaming aspect, right? So uh, certainly, I can't say that this is a Pareto improvement in New York City, for instance. So there are people who are going to be hurt by this change. The people like you who like to play games, right? Um, <laughs> we, you know, that's that's fine. But so that takes us back to this idea of leveling the playing field, right? right. So to justify these changes, you know, it's it is a redistribution from those who have the ability to strategize and those who don't. And that's the, the main uh, uh, lesson from the Boston experience. So Boston has a controlled choice plan, uh, a very decorated history of student assignment um, uh, in Boston. Um, so they used to use race until 1999. 
And they use uh, a system that's probably the most common school choice mechanism in the US. So this is a system that's used um, right here in Cambridge, actually, for elementary school. It's uh, used in San Francisco, in Denver, in Miami, in Tampa, St. Petersburg, uh, Albany. If you look at a city, it's most likely using this mechanism. Okay? So how does this mechanism work? Uh, it's very similar to the deferred acceptance algorithm, but it has one important difference. Okay? So we start just like we did before with students proposing to the schools. The schools will look at all their proposals and assign people um, one at a time based on the priority ordering. So you have a sibling nearby, a sibling at the school and you live nearby, you know, you will likely get a seat at the school. Okay? And you're assigned, so you're finalized. In deferred acceptance, you are temporarily held. That's why it's called deferred acceptance. Okay? While here, uh, the students will be finalized um, if they have a high enough priority relative to everyone else who's ranked the school as their first choice. Okay? Um, so in the subsequent round, uh, people who were not lucky enough to get their first choice will then propose to their second choice. The schools uh, at that stage will only be those schools that still have capacity left over. Okay? So we're not deferring assignment. Uh, so very popular schools, for instance, will have filled up by round two. Uh, the schools that are left over in round two will simply look at the set of applicants and assign them one by one according to the priority order up to capacity. Okay? So this is what the Boston mechanism is doing. Intuitively, what it's trying to do is give everyone their first choice. Have people apply. If you're good enough to get your first choice, then you're assigned. You're done. Okay? So I think that's one of the reasons why this is the most popular mechanism. Now, what's the issue with this mechanism? A first choice maximizing mechanism uh, is manipulable. Right? If I'm a child going through the system and there's a really uh, popular school that I really like as my first choice and there is uh, my second choice, which I have pretty good priority for, but it's not so great, I could take the chance and risk it and rank this really popular school. But when I do that, I'm blowing my chance at my second choice because it could be filled up. Or I could take a safe strategy and just rank my second choice uh, and be guaranteed that. So what can we say empirically about what happens? Let me start off with some anecdotes. So this is a quote from the actual Boston Public School <laughs> Guide, the brochure, um, a direct quote. For a better chance of your quote, first choice school, consider choosing less popular schools. Okay? So the school administrators were aware of the fact that there is this gaming uh, incentive. That, yeah, the quotes are in the original, yeah, that's right, yes. Uh, okay, so that's uh, one piece of advice. Another uh, 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 anecdotal uh, piece of evidence comes from the West Zone Parents Group. So this is a parent group that's in the western district of the Boston Public Schools, so Jamaica Plain and, and West Roxbury. They, um, I think, are the sophisticated parents. They have an online Google group where they meet to discuss student enrollment. And their discussion usually involves two things. One is, I like the principal at this school, so they typically send some uh, parents to go visit a school and they report back to the group, we like the principal, we don't like the gym. And then they also talk about strategies. Okay, so here's their uh, frequently asked questions from 2003. One school choice strategy is to find a school you like that is undersubscribed and put it as a top choice. Or find a school that you like that is popular and put it as a first choice and find a school that is less popular for a, quote, safe second choice. Okay. So there is some anecdotal evidence that people are aware of the strategic issue in the Boston mechanism. Okay. Now, empirically, I mentioned uh, the question was, can we, what can we say firmly about this? One thing we can say is, in this type of mechanism, a really bad strategy is to rank two very popular schools as your first and second choice. Why is that a bad strategy? Well, you might get lucky and get your first choice. But if your second choice is also very popular, you're wasting your second choice, right? Uh, now, how do we know whether the school is going to be popular or not? That depends on what happens in the years. So this is actually not a dominated strategy, but it's a bad strategy. Uh, and about a fifth of participants do that, actually, uh, in the old system in Boston before 2005. They would rank um, two popular schools as their first and second choice. So um, I think that's uh, a relatively clear evidence that uh, some families don't understand the, the rules uh, because if someone were to see that, for instance, at a family resource center, they would have told them you should uh, reorder your preferences. Don't waste your second choice at that popular school. Okay, so what can we say about the manipulability of the Boston mechanism? Well, we could compare the Boston mechanism to the student optimal stable mechanism. 
But that's almost a silly comparison, right? We know the student optimal stable mechanism is strategy proof, so obviously the Boston mechanism is strongly more manipulable than it. Okay? Now let's think about the Boston mechanism when there is a constraint on the number of schools you can rank. Okay? So this is actually how we see the Boston mechanism in place. Luckily we were successful in the argument in Boston to tell them not to have a constraint. But if you look at the system right here in Cambridge, uh, you can only rank three schools. Okay? So it's the Boston mechanism, but you can only rank three schools. At elementary school there are about 12 options uh, in Cambridge. The Providence, Rhode Island mechanism, you can only rank two schools. Providence, <laughs> I think they have about eight elementary schools, actually. <laughs> um, okay, so what we can do is think about the capped versions of both of these mechanisms, the capped version of Boston and the capped version of the student optimal rule. We know when they're uncapped, the student optimal rule is the least manipulable strategy proof. Uh, and when they're capped, uh, the Boston mechanism, when it's capped at K, you can only rank K schools, is going to be weakly more manipulable than the student optimal stable mechanism when you can only rank K. So the manipulability of Boston relative to the student optimal mechanism uh, continues to hold for both capped mechanisms. Okay? Or, or, but in this case, it's only weekly. It's only weekly. Only yeah, that's right. Uh, same, same with the previous case. Right. The, the so it's not Uh, so, uh, with Boston uncapped, yes. um, we don't have a result actually um, so about that. We need some kind of um, yeah, so we, I can't rank um, Boston <coughs> uncapped to cap New York. I can only rank them when they're both capped. I'm sorry? Uh, if India, yeah, I don't think that's true, actually. You know, the, the other result... You can probably find um, counterexamples to a strict order either way, I would think. In, in this case, in his case? No, uh, I mean, if you're capping one, you're not... I mean, so if the boss one, one, one. The, the one thing that's very related to that comment, actually, is why don't we think about the Boston mechanism when it's capped at different cap points? K versus L Boston. Is one mechanism more manipulable than the other mechanism? It turns out that uh, those two mechanisms are equally manipulable. So whenever I can manipulate the K mechanism, I can manip manipulate the L mechanism and vice versa. And the reason is exactly, I think, what you're hinting at. In the Boston mechanism, how do I manipulate? All I do is I take the school that I could get from the manipulation and rank it as my first choice. Because uh, if I could get it from my manipulation, I can get it when I rank it as my first choice. Because my odds only increase when I rank it as my first choice. So therefore, if I can manipulate the kth mechanism, I do it by ranking as my first choice. I can do the same thing for the lth mechanism. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, yes. So this only works for weak manipulability. I'm going to skip the example when we have strong manipulability and move on to talk about auctions. Okay. So we have three examples for auctions. Um, uh, yeah. Is sure. Transitive. Transitive meaning. Uh, Uh, provided I have the same domain of problems. So, um, like if k is more manipulable than k plus uh, 1, k plus 1 is more manipulable than k plus 2, then k is more manipulable than k plus 2, yeah. So we'll see that also in this example, actually. Uh, so uh, single unit auctions, uh, so the environment is we have a single unit to be sold. But is this yeah. not pure mathematically to me? Because if I have this F sort of, okay, if this is then this, so that part is obviously transitive. Mm -hmm. I don't understand, I'm sorry. Well, you need to manipulate it. It seems that even though it seems not transitive, because you need a specific example, because you need one counter example. I think it's fine, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely transitive, yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah. just the inequality is on that partial order. So the, the, the parentheses would work under the transitive relation as well, right? Um, uh, okay, single unit auction, uh, N bidders, value VI. Uh, we're just going to assume the utility of an agent who wins the object at price P is just VI minus the price paid. Okay, so we want to think about a class of mechanisms for this um, 
single unit problem, uh, and we'll call these kth price auctions. So when k is 2, we have a second price auction. Um, that's Vickery's famous uh, mechanism. Uh, other people have studied uh, the third price auction. So uh, the first reference I've seen to that is a paper of Kegel and Levin. Actually, a lot of computer scientists have studied uh, kth price auctions. Uh, so what is a kth price auction? Everyone simultaneously bids for the object. The highest bidder receives the object, and he pays the kth highest price. Okay. So uh, Vickery's second price auction, when k is 2, is probably the best known strategy proof mechanism. Right? Uh, however, none of the other kth price auctions are strategy proof. So they're all strongly more manipulable than the second price auction. Okay? Uh, our next result, Proposition 4, extends this well-known result. So if I'm going to compare the lth price auction, where l is greater than k, to the kth price auction, the lth price auction is strongly more manipulable than the kth price auction. Okay? So uh, let's go through an example to see why this is true. So I have a, a situation where there are five bidders, okay, and their values are ordered here from V5 to V1. And I want to compare the third uh, price auction to the fourth price auction. So what happens when uh, we think about the third price auction and everyone tells the truth? Well, the guy who has the highest declared valuation is V1, value um, agent 1, and he's going to pay uh, the third highest declared valuation, V3. Okay? Could he manipulate? Uh, he could declare he's got a higher value. That's not going to affect the price he pays. He could declare he's got a lower value. If he declares his value is lower than V2, he's not going to win the object, so that's not in his interest. So it's weakly dominant for him to say, my value is V1. Let's look at the guys on the left side uh, before we get to V2. Would uh, V3 um, uh, be able to manipulate this auction, the third guy? Well, he's not winning the object right now when he tells the truth. The only way he could affect his payoff is to say, I have the highest value. So if he does that, he's going to be jumping over this guy and say, I have a higher value than V1. Then the third highest value is going to be this right here. Uh, that's higher than his own value, so that's not profitable. So the guy who can manipulate the third price auction is actually V2. Okay. What could V2 say? Well, he could say, I actually have the highest value. Uh, he wins the object and he doesn't affect the price he pays. Right? So V2, uh, he'd say, I'm higher than V1. The third is still V3. Okay. Now, when we go to the fourth price auction, the same logic basically applies. The guys who could manipulate the fourth price auction are V3 and V2, both of them. Okay? Um, and that's why it's more manipulable. Yeah, yeah. Why should we expect people to be telling the truth in the first place if they have to compete but the second price auction? Uh, so if they're not telling the truth, we can do equilibrium analysis. That's fine. You know, the way we typically would do this is with revenue equivalents. We would say that all auction formats are equivalent. They generate the same amount of revenue. I'm, I'm happy to say that. Um, uh, the way you can think about this is if I'm an agent thinking about these two different auction mechanisms, I'm just, I have some reports from other agents. They don't necessarily have to be truthful. They're just some fixed reports. And I'm requiring that those reports be fixed across the comparison. So if you don't like the idea of truth telling, what's critical is something is fixed across the comparison. Yeah. Is it then true that the second price auction is the best and otherwise it's monotone or is that not the case? Uh, I, I actually haven't thought about that. That's a very interesting question. So second price would still be dominant strategy, obviously. Um, <coughs> but if we thought about uh, some weighted combination of right, 1 .9 yeah, 1.9 uh, or some, some point in between here, I'd have to think about that. I, I actually don't know. Um, you know, I if... Uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I have to think about that. I don't know off the top of my head uh, on that one. Uh, yeah, we could, we could easily check that, though. Um, uh, okay, so this argument easily generalizes. Uh, in a case price auction, the guys between 2 and k minus 1 can all potentially manipulate. In the L price auction, the guys from 2 to L minus 1 can all manipulate. So if manipulation is strictly profitable in the kth price auction, it's also strictly profitable in the lth price auction. Okay, let me talk about internet advertisement auctions. Okay, so um, 
probably not uh, 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 something unfamiliar to this crowd, right? So I'm going to work with the model that pioneered by Edelman, Ostrovsky, and Michael Schwartz. Uh, we have n bidders on a, uh, uh, in our model, and we have m slots on a web page. We're going to uh, work with click-through rates um, that are ordered. Uh, so a click-through rate for slot 1 is alpha 1, slot 2 is alpha 2, and, uh, and these are common knowledge. Okay? Uh, each bidder has a private value vi per click. So if a bidder uh, receives slot s at price p, his utility is just going to be the value per uh, click times the click-through rate. That's alpha s times vi minus the price he pays uh, for this. Okay, so this is definitely a stripped-down model of what actually happens. I know that. Um, but this is one of the first models of this, I think. So uh, there are two mechanisms that um, people have discussed, and uh, Edelman and Ostrovsky and Schwartz in particular have talked about. The first is the generalized first price mechanism. Um, the way this works is each agent simultaneously bids for a slot. The highest bidder receives the first slot at a price of her bid times the click-through rate of slot one. Uh, the second highest guy receives the second slot times at a price of her bid times the click-through rate of slot two, etc. Okay. Second mechanism, uh, the generalized second price uh, mechanism, uh, same setup, each agent simultaneously bids for a slot. Sec the highest bidder receives the first slot, but instead uh, his price is determined by the second highest bid times the click-through rate of slot one. Right? Okay, so you guys all know this, right? So, okay, sorry to spend the time on this. What do I want to investigate? Uh, well, neither the GFP or the GSP is a strategy proof mechanism. Um, but what Edelman, Ostrovsky, and Schwartz say in their paper is that why have so many uh, um, internet platforms switched to the GSP? This is a quote from their paper. The second price structure makes the market more user friendly and less susceptible to gaming. Okay, so and they gave no proof of that. We have no notion of what susceptibility right, what to gaming means, right? right. right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I'm try trying to do, exactly, right? And so, as you can imagine... Um, yeah, they have one, one thing. Well, no, 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 it's the cycling. Right, the cycling is, is also just a form of not reaching um, equilibrium. Yeah, why is, more, yeah. than, more than a gaming, it's kind of that the, that the system is not reaching equilibrium. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so as you can imagine, uh, the GFP is strongly more manipulable mm -hmm. than the GSP. So let me talk about my last example. So um, multi-unit auctions. Um, so think treasury bills. Uh, we have K identical treasury bills for sale and N bidders. Mm -hmm. uh, the utility of an agent who receives L objects at a total price P is just the sum of his valuation for each of the objects minus the price paid, the total price paid. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is uh, an environment that people have used to model electricity auctions, the initiation of certain financial exchanges. I want to talk about two formats. Uh, the first is the discriminatory auction. Um, that's your pay as pay your bid auction. So uh, the mechanism I want to think about is everyone submits a bid for the units. So agent I will submit a bid for his first unit, a bid for a second unit, etc. And the k highest bidders receive uh, the objects. So we take all these bids, find the k highest ones, and everyone pays their bid. Okay, so this is the pay your bid format. Uniform price auction. Uh, the same exact information is solicited from the participants. Uh, the highest uh, k bidders each receive the object, but they pay the same price. Okay, this is a market clearing price or a uniform price. Uh, you can do this in a few ways. One way to do this is have them all pay the k plus one highest price. Okay, so if we just had one object here, we're thinking about a first price auction versus a second price auction. Um, again, we have multiple units here. Uh, throughout this talk, we've seen multiple units introduce these problems. Uh, so this simple uniform price auction is not going to be strategy proof, uh, even though it seems like the second price auction. Okay. So uh, the Which U.S. Yeah, that's right. That, so this, the, I think the idea behind this was to be like a second price auction, but the Vickery mechanism is the only strategy proof mechanism here. U.S. Treasury experience. So the U.S. Treasury has switched back and forth between discriminatory and uniform price formats. 
In the 70s, the Treasury used a discriminatory price format for Treasury bonds. In 1992, they switched to the uniform price for a subset of bonds for the two and five year notes. Um, this has been uh, uh, experimented with in no a number of countries, like in Mexico and Sweden. Uh, but one of the earliest proponents of the virtues of the uniform price auction over a discriminatory price auction was actually Milton Friedman. Sorry, okay. What do you mean by discriminatory? That, that was just the definition. Discriminatory. Okay. So yeah. the, the game is everyone submits a bid for each unit. Uh, we compute who the K highest bids are. And if you are one of the K highest bidders, you have to pay your bid for each unit you get. Okay. Uh, That's right. We could set it to be the kth, or we could take a you know interval between <laughs> k plus one and k, as sometimes is done. Um, okay, so Milton Friedman, actually, um, perhaps you should de deserve credit for uh, you know defining this uniform price auction. There's this remarkable testimony that was published in 1960, but the testimony is from 1959. He's testifying to the Joint Economic Committee of Congress, and the question was, how should we auction off our debt? Um, and this is what he said. He said in his testimony that the uniform price auction is, quote, strategically simpler than the discriminatory price auction. Uh, in particular, the uniform price format levels the playing field. Specialized knowledge that dealers have to be able to strategize is not that important because it's a market clearing price. Um, and then, so this actually came back to the fore in 1991 as the Treasury was thinking about the switch in 1992. And in a Wall Street Journal editorial, Friedman says, more bidders would be induced to bid directly because the fear of being awarded securities at too high a price is eliminated under the uniform format. Okay? So neither of these mechanisms are strategy proof. Uh, around this time, people made similar arguments that something is less susceptible to gaming. The uniform price format is less susceptible to gaming. And that's our last result. Okay? So the discriminatory price format is strongly more manipulable than the uniform price auction. Okay? So, um, let me wrap up with this last slide. Um, so strategy proofness, you have a question? No, okay, sorry. Strategy proofness is, I think, a very plausible requirement, uh, but at the same time, it's very demanding, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the approach that we've thought about today, uh, um, we hope is useful in some situations where researchers want to compare mechanisms based on their incentive properties. And I think what's uh, surprised us about this project was we were able to unify these six different applications, uh, real-world applications, within one common framework and provide one formalization about the relative manipulability of certain mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a good reason why every time you, if you can just scale to the right mechanism, it's much longer to prove that it works in one of the better places? They, they uh, haven't come up with the right mechanism, <laughs> right? Well, I, what, do you, what example? The GSP, you mean? Of your intuition? I, I can, and in fact, I think that's the right thing. That means if I had something opposite your intuition, you would question my definition, right? Um, now, um, you're, you're <laughs> saying, are, are we using, a, um, you know, why did they come up with the right thing? Um, you know, is the GSP the right thing? You could say the, the Vickery mechanism is the right thing. Well, right? I don't see why. <laughs> What do, yeah, what's, what does that mean? It's so complicated. But also in like a repeated context, does the whole strategy proofness thing make any sense anyway? That's the first thing. Yes, and that, of course, is a very good question. I mean, and much more relevant than school yeah. choice where you're really stuck in that yeah. school. Like in, the, in an ad auction, you might want to bid a lot to drive your competitor out of business first and then mm -hmm. uh, bid mm -hmm. things out later. Uh, yeah, that's right. So we, you know, we should analyze that model. I, I certainly agree. If we want to think about dynamics, so that would be actually uh -huh. interested that that becomes less and less strategy proof if it is repeated more often. Uh huh. I would imagine that does. I mean, the other thing is that some people kind of think that GSP is, you know, truthful and therefore they have more of a tendency to bid somewhat closer to their true valuation, which increases revenue in, in a way. So I mean, I would. In, in fact, if you look at the Edelman-Ostrowski paper, right, they have a, a quote, I think an early draft of this paper had a quote on 
Google's promotional materials on uh, the GSP, which they said it's based on Nobel Prize winning <laughs> ideas, right, to um, get people to bid the, uh, directly, right? It's based on it. It's based on it, sure. Sure, it, it, it kind of games the system based on it. <laughs> Um, when you draw these proofs for these things, mm -hmm. well, are they all just case analysis for each one, or is there some structure property that you can quantify for when you can show? Uh, uh, no, it, it depends on the mechanism. Uh, it depends on the particular features of the mechanism. So the, uh, there are basically two types of proofs here. One is to say, I, if I have a manipulation in one mechanism, I use that information to construct a manipulation in the other one. Okay. Uh, the second type of proof like for our result about the Boston mechanism is to say, when is the Boston mechanism when you can only rank K schools not manipulable? It turns out that's rarely the case. Boston's a really highly manipulable mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's such a special set of preferences that that happens that under those preferences there's really no conflict of interest among people. So the student optimal mechanism when you can only rank K schools is not manipulable. So those are two different strategies, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. In these situations, can you show that in general there exists a lower bound, something which is more strategy proof than everything else? Um, we, we can't say that in general. Um, we could say it in the stable matching problem, for instance. So no strategy proof mechanism. Restrict ourselves to stable mechanisms. You know, there is one that's least manipulable for colleges, the college optimal rule. But that's related to Madhu's earlier question. We don't have a general characterization for, uh, you know, uh, it, it, that's, that, that's the only case where we have that characterization. So, yeah. so you don't have like the extreme points of this partial order? Uh, not, not in all of these applications. Right. I mean, you, you like, do I guess in the case price auction we also do, right? In, uh -huh. your, in, in your definition, you have a partial order, or yeah. rather a set of partial orders that depend on the agents. Mm -hmm. And so given partial orders, you kind of do have extreme points, but then what, somehow the intersection of No, these. no, 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 you need some lattice structure. You need yeah. some lattice structure, I guess. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, going back to the motivation, so it's nice that you have this, you know, way to compare two uh, mechanisms, mm -hmm. uh, but what you might care about is something about social optimality. So mm -hmm. is there any understanding of, you know, if one is more manipulative than another, is it really going to be uh, better for being socially optimal? Is it certainly going to be yeah, so my stance on this is a little bit controversial, actually. So usually an economist would ask that question. Why do, well, don't we care about the outcomes of the mechanism, not about the manipulability? And yes, we care about the outcomes, but I think some of the quotes that I brought up have illustrated that we also care about the procedural dimensions of a mechanism. Mm -hmm. This idea that we want to protect people who don't understand the rules. And that should be a dimension that we should also consider, uh, is, is my sense. So if we want to think about manipulation, is it bad, what we can do is you know, this approach of let's compute the equilibrium of the game. And then we have to ask, is that a reasonable thing, a reasonable prediction, and what's the efficiency of that equilibrium? Uh, that's certainly valid, and you know, it's, it's worthwhile thinking about. I think what, what's been highlighted here, that the, n the new aspect is, in the school problem, for instance, you know, they, policymakers care about this idea of leveling the playing field. In fact, that's what the superintendent in Boston said as well, just like Milton Friedman. And that's not necessarily related towards, you know, it's a cost, an efficiency cost, but one that's not modeled. It's not in your utility function. So you're getting the social optimum of a utility function that doesn't include this cost this of strategizing, of right? Yes. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you could, and, and that's one argument you often hear, why do we have the Boston mechanism? We're going to force people, again, related to your comment as well, to strategize, and when they're strategizing, they're going to also learn about what's a good school, and that's going to be good for them. Um, you have to believe that those things are compliments, I think. And <laughs> I guess you have to believe in the faith of humanity, right? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs>